the puzzle facing these historians is why the Industrial Revolution happened when and where it did. So far, they have looked back over the hundred years leading up to the dawn of rail travel in 1830. They have traced back the origins of mass production and showed how investors and inventors exploited Britain's natural resources to create the world's first consumer society. But for the Industrial Revolution to take off, there was another vital ingredient, trade. By 1830, the Liverpool docks were booming. Imports and exports kept the factories running. Yet how had such a small country come to dominate world trade? To try to answer that question, our investigators will go back 250 years. At the end of the 16th century, if you had tried to guess which country would become the king of global trade, you certainly wouldn't have picked Britain. Nearby Holland was a much better candidate. But for future staying power, another empire looked much more promising. The Ottoman Empire. They had wealth and sophistication. In partnership with their Arab neighbors, they traded in the wealth of the Far East. They were the main link in a chain of Islamic civilizations stretching halfway across the globe. The Ottomans had control of all the known trade routes to China and the East. So European traders were desperate to find a new route that would bypass the Ottomans by trying to discover a sea passage through America. It was a venture that epitomizes the commercial potential of exploration. The Northwest Passage is an attempt by Europeans to sail to the East, that is to say, to sail to China and to India, where there were all these commodities that they wanted, without having to circumnavigate Africa. Now, it couldn't be done, but they didn't know that. In 1609, the year that Shakespeare's King Lear was performed for the first time, and Galileo made his first telescope, a ship called the Half Moon nosed its way upriver past the island that would later be known as Manhattan. On that side of the river, which is called Manahatta, they appear to be a friendly people, but are much inclined to steal and are adroit at carrying away whatever they take a fancy to. The Half Moon was passing the site of what would one day be a great city. But Captain Henry Hudson had no inkling of that. He wasn't there to found New York. He was searching for the Northwest Passage. He and other merchant explorers were laying the foundations for a European go-anywhere trading empire that would one day cover the world. The countries of Europe were competing to colonize new territories so explorers like Hudson could take advantage of this rivalry. Although he was an English captain, Hudson's expedition was financed by the French, and his ship and crew were Dutch. The reason he went to the Dutch is because the British uh, wouldn't pay for, his, for, his, for that trip. And as this is, of course, a story we know, because in some sense, Columbus and other explorers did very much the same things. They shopped around. So if you are an explorer, or for that matter, an inventor, or somebody with a new idea, and you're trying to sell it to King A, and King A says, I'm not interested, you say, all right, I'll go to King B. And if mm. King B doesn't take it, it'll be <laughs> King C. This is what is known in Europe as the state system. On the Hudson River, Joel Mockier met the captain of a replica of the Half Moon. It seems a little hard to believe that Hudson really did think that he might be on the way to Asia. So he was voyaging into a circumstance where at any moment he could have rounded a bend like we have right out here, could have rounded Stony Point, looked up the river, and suddenly seeing the expanse of the Pacific. <laughs> he had crossed the Atlantic in gruesome conditions cramped quarters with the constant risk of dysentery, disgusting food, and on top of that, all the dangers of the sea. Someone once described it as a jail sentence with the added daily risk of death. 
People like to draw parallels between the explorers of, of the 17th century with the Apollo voyages to the moon, but you know, really there is no comparison there is no because there was no team of thousands of engineers back at home port advising them on what to do. They had to be completely self-contained. Yes. But the potential rewards were great. Cutting out the middleman of the Ottoman Empire would create a direct link with the source of silks, chinaware, and spices, and would bring almost limitless wealth. Whoever found the route to the east would instantly become the Bill Gates of the age. When Hudson discovered that he was on a river and not a channel through America, he returned to his native London, where the English seized his ship. The Half Moon was taken by the English. The ship's papers and logs were taken by the English. They certainly knew how valuable this information was that he had gleaned. There was very tough economic competition between the Dutch and the English. The Dutch were also at war with Spain. And the insightful information gained from this type of voyage was extraordinarily valuable and, and irreplaceable. Hudson did sail again the following year, this time in an English ship. They became iced up in northern Canada. Hudson was so driven that he didn't care about the conditions on board. But his crew was less keen as scurvy began to take its toll. Their gums are receding, they're, they're barely able to move, they've, they've become emaciated, almost like skeletons. And Hudson's prepared to spend another winter in these conditions in his search for this Northwest Passage. The crew wasn't. They put him and his son ashore to die in what is now known as Hudson's Bay. Of course, there was no way around North America. But the search for the Northwest Passage meant that Europeans could gain a foothold in the New World. Five years later, Dutch settlers arrived in Manhattan to found New Amsterdam. Building settlements was the first stage in creating a supply line to send raw materials back to Europe. This trade and the knowledge gained from exploration helped lay the foundations for the Industrial Revolution. Cotton imports from America would eventually feed the Lancashire mills. But at the beginning of the 17th century, the balance of power was different. Economically, the Dutch were much stronger than the British. They had the largest merchant fleet in the world. Holland was a new republic, full of fresh ideas and awash with money. It was the California of the age. Amsterdam was an international market where you could find goods from all over the world. Japanese and Swedish copper, Baltic grain, Oriental tea, Indonesian spices, Mexican silver. Conditions in Holland looked almost right for industrialization. It often gets overlooked how much of the Dutch success story is actually based on technological advances. And that mm. this isn't just a society that's very good in buying and selling, as their reputation was a little bit. In shipbuilding, for instance, they are the ones that build the most efficient, cheapest mer merchant ships. In terms of its cost per shipping cargo per mile, is by far the most efficient way of moving commodities across the ocean. The Dutch had to employ technological ingenuity to keep the ever-growing system running. They were pretty good at really using what they had. Mm -hmm. So the Netherlands, for instance, does not have very rapidly flowing water, right? Which is what you expect since mm -hmm. the country is as flat mm -hmm. as a pancake. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to have fast flowing rivers. Mm -hmm. So we they, they use windmills because yes. there's a lot of wind. Mm -hmm. But for instance, the country doesn't have any coal. Mm -hmm. And you'd think that is a big obstacle, but in fact, it wasn't because what they did have is peat. Yes. And they used peat very heavily mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. many of their mm -hmm. industrial processes. Now, peat doesn't quite give you as much heat as, as coal does, but if it's very cheap, it mm -hmm. serves as a good substitute, and that's what they use. Above all, the Dutch excelled at organization. 
The spice trade was in the hands of the Dutch East India Company, which had been formed just before Hudson's voyage. They kept control of every part of the operation from their headquarters in Amsterdam. They decided what quantities of what spices should be bought and even dictated exactly where they should be put in the ship's hold. The Dutch even organized the water. They forced the sea back to provide new land, but they actually invited it into their capital city. Amsterdam was being replanned as a system of concentric canals. The wealth of the Dutch created the age of Rembrandt and a tradition of tolerance which remains with them to this day. But the Dutch invention that really changed the world isn't about painting or about canals, it's about finance. As Dutch trade began to reach record levels, merchants needed to borrow money to fund their ambitious ventures. This trade had to be financed and they were also very successful in establishing the kinds of financial institutions to allow this long distance trade to take place, to finance voyages that lasted between two and four years. The solution they found was evident from the look of the Dutch. They had no taste for public displays of wealth. There were no large palaces. They didn't wear ostentatious clothes. They were doing something else with their money. They were reinvesting it. And where there is investment, there is banking. That is their important invention, a system of credit and finance. Nothing illustrates the Dutch appetite for financial speculation more than the sudden urge to invest in tulips in the 1630s. Anyone lured by dot-com fever today will be familiar with the story. Tulips are not originally Dutch. They were actually imported from Turkey, but they began to be very popular in Holland in the decade after Hudson's voyage. No flower like this had ever been seen before. They were rare and wonderful. The Dutch even made special vases just for tulips. Perhaps they were seen as a symbol of the endless new possibilities of the Dutch Golden Age. Whatever the reason, everybody wanted one and their value soared. More and more varieties were bred. They became so valuable that pictures of them were produced as cheap alternatives to the real thing. Prices mounted until there were some bulbs so expensive that they changed hands for the price of a house. Speculation starts in tulip bulbs. And it seems amazing to us now that this becomes the source of what became um, a, a mania, a speculative mania in the 1630s. Even the unostentatious and careful Dutch began to invest heavily in tulips. Prices were going up, there were fortunes to be made. Because you could never be quite sure exactly what the flower would look like, there was an element of risk and of opportunity. People were happy to speculate for high stakes in the tulip futures market. The crash was inevitable. Almost overnight, people realized that they had been trading in nothing more useful than a flower. What had once been an investment with huge potential suddenly became worth slightly less than an onion. For a while, the Dutch hated their national flower. There was even a Dutch professor of botany who roamed Holland hitting tulips with a stick because of what they had done to his country. All of these speculative bubbles 
do show us that people were prepared to be amazingly optimistic and confident about the future possibilities of their economy. Uh, people who bought a... Uh, well, mm. And then swing to pessimism fairly Oh, yes, yes. When, yes. when it does That's pay right. off. But, I mean, people thought that, you know, there, there was, was going to be enough there. money to buy these tulip bulbs, however much they cost, that there was going to be a market for such a great luxury. The episode illustrates a difference in attitude between British and Dutch investors. The Dutch had only limited opportunities for investment. Whereas British entrepreneurs began to put their money into more concrete ventures, such as manufacturing, mining, and other industries. This was only possible after Britain had adopted the Dutch system of banking and credit. Institutions like the Bank of England and the British East India Company were both copied from Holland. That is how the British secured the lion's share of world trade while the Dutch lost their position at the vanguard of Europe's economic progress. The real big question is, why couldn't they sustain that momentum into the next stage? There are no real major breakthroughs. There isn't anything as radical as a steam engine. There are various theories about that. One, which is coal. I mean, coal is about three times as efficient yeah. as peat. And you can do the medieval technologies with peat, but uh, iron smelting and so on is very difficult. So there are certain things you can get to a certain level, but beyond that, you need coal. Britain had another advantage over Holland. Its population was expanding, which enabled the mills to flourish. And what is the population growth? Is it rising at the rate that Britain's is rising in the 18th century? How many of those young men going out on those ships mm. ever returned? Mm. Uh, mm. High proportions yeah. of the Dutch labor force was, lo were, was lost in sustaining this major mercantile yeah. empire. Holland was also vulnerable to invasion. The states of Europe were often fighting each other, but the Dutch suffered a protracted war with France, which drained her economy. In many ways, Britain was in this privileged position of being part of a state system with all the benefits of competition and active neighbors, but less of the flip side, because having 20 miles of ocean between itself and these warring neighbors, less of these things came its direction. It could fire them outwards on its neighbors, but its neighbors never actually managed to get a, gain a foothold. Absolutely. There are great advantages of being an island, and of course the Japanese hmm. enjoyed the same advantage. It doesn't work for all islands, one should mention. For instance, being an island never did seem to have done much for the Irish. And probably the moral is that if you're going to be an island, make sure that there isn't a larger <laughs> island right I next to you. <laughs> the Dutch had invented investment and set up important trade routes. But by the 18th century, their golden age was over. Holland was not big enough to develop into the major manufacturing and consuming nation that Britain was about to become. While Europeans vied with each other for mastery of the globe, there was already one empire that was well acquainted with world trade, the Ottoman Empire. They had a major share of the trade in luxury goods from the East. They were middlemen that European navigators were trying to cut out by finding a passage through America. The Ottomans knew all about empire. They had taken over what was left of the Roman one, 150 years earlier, when they captured Constantinople. Work started on this mosque in 1609, when Hudson was sailing past Manhattan. By then, Istanbul, as they called it, had already been an imperial city for a thousand years, and you might well have thought that it was set to continue. If you visit the Topkapi Palace, where the sultans lived in Istanbul, you are struck by a, a curious contradiction or puzzle. On the one hand, you're enormously impressed. Here is a wonderful garden, beautiful architecture, 
a great civilization which was looking as if it would dominate the world. By 1609, it was when the first foundations were laid here, it looked as if this was going to be the civilization of the whole known world. If you try and answer the question of why an advanced industrial kind of civilization didn't emerge out of the Ottoman Empire, one of the answers is political and social. Many thinkers agreed that for the foundations for such a world, you need liberty. You need a kind of governmental system whereby the people are involved in their own affairs. So you need some kind of democratic system. In fact, history shows that no society which didn't have an element of democracy has ever been economically successful in the long term. The gates of the Sultan's palace, the Sultan lived beyond there and you couldn't go through there, symbolizes one of the most top-down, absolutist, hierarchical, bureaucratic civilizations that has emerged on this earth. And this made certain forms of industrial and other development very difficult, the unpredictability, the heavy taxation, and so on. Exactly the same thing happened to Spain. You might be here in Madrid, or to France, you might be in Versailles. All these agrarian civilizations came to a limit of political centralization and absolutism and couldn't get any further. Europeans mostly saw the Ottoman Empire as something to be avoided. In an age when Europe itself was riven by the fundamental divide between Protestant and Catholic, a Muslim civilization was unlikely to be chosen as a trading partner. It was regarded rather with a mixture of fear and loathing. In 1625, an Essex man called Samuel Purchas publishes four huge volumes in London, which are a history of the voyages of the English nation in a desperate effort to convince his countrymen that all major successful explorations have been made by Englishmen. And the first map which Purchas puts into his book shows you symbolically which parts of the world are Christian and which parts are Muslim. And Purchas is very worried. Mm. It looks to Purchas, sitting on the Essex shore of the Thames in the 1620s, mm. as if Islam is about to take over yeah. the whole planet and only mm. Protestant England and the Netherlands mm. will save Christendom mm. and therefore, as he understands it, civilization mm. from total eclipse. Mm. People at that time, I think, thought about the Ottoman Empire rather in the way that some Westerners thought um, of their most paranoiac about the Soviet Union as a possible threat. It was the great power mm -hmm. that was clearly wanted to take over the world and might well be able to do so mm -hmm. unless someone found some way of holding back this threat. While bigotry the bigotry of ignorance was holding reign in the hearts of unbelievers. God sent down his tranquility on the faithful. The evidence is that the rapid spread of the faith of Islam had its roots in a genuine popular appeal, and not in the desire to dominate the world. It really did give great personal happiness and fulfillment to most of those who believed. Nonetheless, there may be some consequences of Islamic civilization which inhibited progress towards mechanization. The whole of the West became, after Gutenberg in the 15th century, very energized by a new printing revolution. And here, just beside it, absolutely no metal printing. No printing press until the 18th century, 300 years later is a bit of a mystery. It may be something to do with religion, it may be the absence of iron workers, but for whatever reason, printing really didn't take off here. So the technologies which in Western Europe lead to an explosion of knowledge and curiosity and give people tools to explore new avenues, here, none of it. Yet the Ottoman Empire was very effective for a long period. 
It had an enormously wealthy and successful trade system, and there was nothing about Islam that prohibited that. After all, the Prophet Muhammad himself had been a merchant. Why then was it in Western Europe that industrialization first occurred? When Adam Smith was writing his great Wealth of Nations, he wanted to create an opulent, wealthy world that would be like this, except more so. And he said that you could boil down to three things what you really needed. You needed peace, easy taxes, and a due administration of justice. Well, the West had all these things. Had, at least England did. It had peaceful surroundings because it was an island. It had reasonable taxation system and it had a very good legal system. All this bazaar here survived despite not having any of these things. Islam was one of the most warlike civilizations. The Ottomans were great warriors. They'd had to fight off contenders and there was constant civil war feuding battle and wealth was constantly being destroyed so you could never really invest. Easy taxes, very, very unfair, unpredictable, difficult taxation system. And the judicial system was unpredictable, brutal. So he would have said, this has survived despite all that. And there's no way, really, that it can go on much further. You can't get investment, security, trust, contracts in a world like this. But you can in the West. In their pursuit of world trade, the West had another advantage over the Ottomans, which enabled them to travel further and wider in their search for wealth. Trade in the Islamic world had been about tradition, not exploration. Knowledge of how to get to India, for instance, had been handed down through generations. Out with the west wind in the spring, then back again when the wind changed. The Arab dhows that carried the Ottoman trade had used triangular sails for thousands of years. Quite different from the square sails that Europeans had been using since the Greeks and the Romans. Could that difference in type of sail have given the Europeans an unexpected advantage when it came to exploration? Chris Cullen went to the Museum of Sailing History to find out whether the Europeans had ended up with the right sail, even though at first sight the triangular sail seems to be perfect for the job. It was a more efficient rig. It, it could sail into the wind. Um, if you can see how this is, the wind would come from this direction, mm. hit it, give it the aerofoil shape to give yeah. you the drive and pull you forward. Mm -hmm. It was quite an efficient sail, and it still is, mm -hmm. but it's very um, difficult to, to change direction with it. The problem comes when the sailors on a dhow want to change course at sea. To alter the sail, they've got to practically take the boat apart. When they went on voyages and they were trading, it was very limited crew because they couldn't carry the food and the number of crew to do the voyage. They can go out for day sailing and they would change attack then. We've got that with the... And that would take a lot of crew. The dhow. Yeah. The Arab dhow there is a pearling dhow. It goes out sailing for the day. It has mm. a crew of about 20 to 22 mm. to change the rig round. What would happen if you decided you were going to build a ship like this and be Christopher Columbus and try to sail out into the Atlantic to discover America. How, what, would, what would go wrong with a plan like that? He would be going a very long time in one direction before he thought about how he was going to change direction by, by lowering the rig and changing it over to the other side. He probably wouldn't be able to physically carry enough crew with it. It was much easier to change direction in a square-rigged ship. They had the, the rig that would allow them to sail into the wind and change direction. Ah, so how would they do that? At the moment, what, these sails are set for the wind to come from to where? Come, to come from just forward of the beam, and the keel would stop it going sideways, and it would actually go forward. Ah. So from there, they can change the rig from one side to the other. And if they were tacking, these, these spars here would just be going from that side to the, round yes. the other angle. So this enabled people to sail, trading and exploring, in any direction they wanted to. Yes. 
When the Europeans mastered the oceans, they were unwittingly steering a course that would lead towards industrialization. Transporting cargo by sea was fast and efficient. Until the development of railways, moving goods over land was slow and difficult. Places separated by sea, it's easier to travel between them than places separated by land. Trade routes are wet. So boats and above all defensible, reliable cargo carrying boats are what matters. Sailing ships were becoming increasingly complex feats of engineering. The ingenuity of their design was as impressive as the later steam-powered machines of the industrial age. To go anywhere, ships have to be able to cope with all weathers. Ask anyone who has sailed a 17th century vessel through a storm. I've been on this ship in storm conditions when we have seas that are higher than this poop deck rolling in on us and it rides very comfortably. And there's nothing like coming down the face of a wave thinking that you're going to bury the bow and be swept with green water as you would in a clipper bowed vessel of, of a more modern period and then see yourself get to the bottom of the wave and then simply ride up and over it and ride very comfortably, in fact. What one finds is that as you learn your way around the ship, you find that the Complexity begins to fall away when you understand how these systems work. You can't think of it as just a bunch of individual lines and a number of individual pulleys and blocks. You have to think of the sails as systems. And you have to think of the crew that's operating this as an entire system. And when the system can work together and work well, it's very efficient and very elegant to sail. The Europeans not only had technically superior ships, their voyages were scientific missions of exploration. This thirst for new knowledge embraced the oceans and undiscovered territories of the world. Shift focus to England, 17th century. The knowledge-making system of 17th century England has a very powerful ideological warrant laid down by Francis Bacon, the Lord Chancellor, in the 1610s and 20s. Many shall travel and knowledge will be increased. That's the slogan of his work. And on the frontispiece of Francis Bacon's great books on the improvement of the sciences, you see ships sailing away from the known to the unknown world and then bringing back from the unknown world goods, commodities, facts, marvels, wonders, things of, as Bacon said, light and profit. So that's the ideological theme that's driving this. But there's also painfully and painstakingly constructed around new knowledge-making institutions like the Royal Society of London navigational and astronomical systems which make an enormous difference to the reliability of marine trade. Navigation at sea was the most pressing problem facing the learned members of the Royal Society. There was no greater obstacle to the growth of knowledge and trade. As scientists, they were dedicated to understanding the minutiae of the natural world using precision instruments. Yet the effects of their obsessive quest would have far-reaching consequences for Britain. What we see is intense control over small pieces of matter. And that intense control over small pieces of matter gave you Europeans long-range control through navigation, through chemistry, through the production of new substances over vast territories of the world. So to master the small gave you power over the great. You get increasingly reliable, increasingly accurate compasses. Fellows of the Royal Society experiment on those. Navigators improve magnetic design. Magnetism becomes, in the 17th and 18th century, an English science. Then think about longitude the great problem of navigation. 
knowing how far east or west you are from home. It's very, very difficult to even work out a method reliably to produce longitude, such that in 1714, Parliament offers a prize of enormous size for anyone who can get an accurate lo longitude method. Knowing the exact location of your ship is a vital part of coming home safely. While longitude remained a problem, 60% of all sailors died at sea. Something had to be done. Up to that time, navigators had managed to get round the problem. The Spanish had just carried their Mexican silver due west across the Pacific. If they stayed at the same latitude, they didn't need to know exactly how far west they were. They just knew that if they kept going, they would hit the Philippines sooner or later. In the middle of the ocean, Henry Hudson didn't know quite how close to America he was. But when he was a few hundred miles out to sea and the ship sailed over the shallower waters of the continental shelf, his crew managed to get advanced warning. They would drop a lead line. The records of on voyages that Hudson was making for the Dutch, they were dropping the lead line to 600 feet. And it would not be unusual to find a vessel of this nature dropping a lead line in the middle of the ocean to approximately 1,000 feet of depth. Now, this is a man leaning over the side, hand over hand, paying out a lead line, and then having to haul that 1,000 feet back up again. It's phenomenal when you think about this. But a lead weight on a string is not going to be good enough if you want an empire that can go anywhere and do anything. What was needed was a more accurate clock, so that no matter where you were, you knew the exact time back in Greenwich. If you knew that, you could look at the sun and work out how far east or west you had traveled. John Harrison became one of the most famous craftsmen in history and eventually won the government's prize when he managed to build a series of clocks that would keep time for months in rough seas at all temperatures. Someone with a Harrison chronometer would always know exactly where in the world they were. But in the whole of his life, Harrison only built four working marine chronometers. There were never going to be enough of them. The problem was that it took even a skilled watchmaker a month just to understand how the Harrison chronometer was made. And what makes longitude soluble and reliable, it seems to me, is that great 18th century principle, the division of labor. A young watchmaker called John Arnold managed to rework the design so that it could be made in workshops by people with specific skills. It was as great a task as Harrison's original one, but eventually he was able to make clocks efficiently and with an absolute minimum of expensive components. Arnold and his London clockmaker colleagues made hundreds of these so that every ship could be given a reliable and potentially identical chronometer. This thing could be produced and reproduced. And the same, in, and this is, seems, seems to be something that the Europeans do continuously. Once they have a good idea that works, they are able to reproduce it. And the net result is massive economic impact. I mean, an Arnold cr cr chronometer, it seems to me, is just as important a consequence and also cause of the Industrial Revolution as a steam engine because of the world effects that these kinds of devices have and because of the production process which they embody. In the 1760s, the European nations were racing to colonize the last remaining uncharted parts of the world. The British Admiralty sent Captain James Cook on a series of voyages to explore the Pacific Ocean and to seek out new opportunities for British trade. Under the patronage of the Royal Society, he was one of the first seamen to try out the new chronometers. Cook's voyages were a typically a European mixture of the desire to conquer the natural world through science 
and the desire to conquer the world. At one level, his mission was about scientific theory. He was going to measure the size of the solar system by observing the planet Venus. At another, it was deeply practical to find ways of provisioning a new Pacific Empire, to look for anything that might be useful. This beautiful piece is a Maori canoe baler brought back to England after Captain Cook's final voyage into the Pacific. And in many ways, it symbolizes the extraordinary expertise in navigation and trade which the Polynesians possessed and which so impressed the, the British. This object was made entirely with stone tools out of wonderful wood from New Zealand and bound with flax, one of the materials which the British imagined they could use to build their own Pacific fleet. It was the accumulation and then the display of marvelous objects like this one, which turned European museums into the storehouses of creation, the sites where knowledge and expertise, artifacts and skills were accumulated and could then be played back into the world as the basis of new global trading empires. The collection of 30,000 botanical specimens that they brought home gave the British the knowledge which would allow them to make empires by moving plants around the globe. The new empire was ready for expansion. It wasn't long before there was a British colony in Australia, in the town of Botany Bay. What's important is not, as it were, the heroic capacity of individuals like Cook and his men, to get from London to Tahiti and back again extraordinarily quickly. It's the rapidity of the period between 1769, when James Cook arrives in the South Seas for the first time, and 1788, which is you know, less than three decades later, when the British establish an entirely new colony in Botany Bay with thousands of people, men and women and children and animals, with the presupposition that what Botany Bay will do is to allow a new British Imperium in the whole of the Southern Pacific. In the 30 years since the first moon landing, less has happened in <coughs> space travel mm. than the 30 years between Cook on Tahiti in 1769 and Captain Philip in Botany Bay in 1788. And that's an extraordinary testimony to what the naval system allowed a European power, especially in this case Britain, to do at immense range. The British Empire was a cargo cult. It was in the great holds of the merchant ships that the goods on which the Empire's wealth and political power depended were carried. And the British were never content to rely on what nature provided them with. On the contrary, the empire exchanged goods from one part of the world to another. When the English ships entered the Pacific in the 1760s and 1770s, they immediately searched for hemp with which to produce the ropes on which their ships relied, flax with which to build sails, and the timber out of which the hulls were going to be constructed. It was this commitment to switching natural products from one part of the world to another that drove British imperial and economic expansion. Sugar, tea, rubber were switched from one part of the world to another. Nature was changed so that the British could profit. <laughs> By the time the rocket made its first journey in 1830, the go-anywhere trade empire was fully in place. Conditions in London were just right for investment and the volume of British trade trebled. Unlike the Ottomans and the Spanish before them, the British didn't just take things, they moved them around the globe. 
the ships were filled up and emptied at each port of call, and each time a profit was made. Manufactured goods were taken from Britain to North America. Furs were taken from New York to Britain. Sugar and rum were taken on from Jamaica. Manufactured goods were taken from Liverpool to Africa. From Africa were taken people. The system of trade relied on the millions of black African slaves who were brought by force from their homes to work in the plantations of the West Indies and North America. It was the cotton trade, after all, which made Liverpool and Manchester wealthy and which provided the motive for linking them by rail. The shock waves from the Industrial Revolution in Britain quickly spread across the Atlantic to America. The island at the mouth of the Hudson River was doing well out of the rise of European global travel. The volume of trade in New York was growing at an unprecedented rate. But the other advantage of this trade network was that reliable and useful knowledge spread more easily. Just how fast knowledge could travel already is shown by the spread of the idea of the rocket itself because it was a New Yorker who, in 1830, brought the steam locomotive to America. Peter Cooper had a financial interest in a new railroad. The only trouble was they were intending to use horses instead of steam engines. He was so alarmed by this that he decided to save his investment. He'd heard about the new steam locomotives being built in Britain, and he just took an imported steam engine and put it on a railway truck. So it was that in August 1830, just over a year after the rocket itself had been built, a group of American officials had their first rickety ride on a steam train. That is how fast the Industrial Revolution was spreading to the quiet island which Henry Hudson had ignored. By the 19th century, large parts of the globe were dominated by the West. The ability to navigate all over the world had enabled the British to grab not only a go-anywhere empire, but the largest empire the world had ever seen. By looking back over 250 years, the story of how Europeans came to control global trade and information can be seen as an essential step towards industrialization. Another perplexing question will emerge when the investigation takes a 500-year leap back in time. In 1350, Europe was a relatively backward place, and Britain a mere blip on the horizon. Back then, China was the mightiest empire in the world, with a long history of scientific innovation. So why was there a reversal of fortune? Why did medieval technologies take off in the West, but not in the East? <laughs> 